Well, um, welcome everyone. We are thrilled to have you here uh, this evening. Um, I see some familiar names, but for those of you who don't know me, um, I am Laura Maines and I'm the CEO of Every Child. Um, we're, we're really thrilled to have you join us for our first of this year, Parent Up Pittsburgh webinar. Um, we really developed uh, Parent Up Pittsburgh and I, and I have to um, acknowledge Jamie Simmons and uh, Sydney Rabinovitz who was just on. They are really the architects of, of this webinar that we have um, about quarterly each year. Um, the intent was to really provide parents with, um, parents of teens and tweens in particular, uh, with a safe space to ask questions, to network with other parents. Um, you know, one of the things that we've really noticed in the work that we do is that often um, if parents have not had a child who's, who's been involved in either the mental health system or, um, or in other systems of support, uh, they may not know where to go when that child becomes a tween or a teen and they start to notice some behaviors that might be concerning to them. Um, they're not really sure where, where to go with that. Uh, sometimes they ask their pediatrician, sometimes they just worry about it. And so we thought we have access to a lot of regional expertise, um, both on staff and, and in our community of partners. And we thought we could bring this resource to parents so that you, you have a place to come to learn a little bit more about what might be going on with your teen or tween um, and ask questions and really uh, sort of parent up your, uh, your parenting skills. So we're thrilled to have you. We really do hope it's going to be helpful. I, I think it will be. Um, I want to thank our sponsor, NAMI Keystone PA. They have just been a wonderful partner. Um, and this is their second year with us uh, for our Parent Up program. So we're really, we're really thrilled to have them. Uh, I do wanna note that this webinar is being recorded and we will post it on our YouTube channel. So if you miss something, you can always go back there and, and check it out. Um, if you, as, you're, as we're going through um, our conversation this evening, if you think, wow, you know, my neighbor, my aunt, my friend, my, uh, my mom could really benefit from, uh, from listening to this, please direct them to the, to the YouTube channel. They can access it anytime for free um, on their own schedule. So our next session will be November 8th at 6 p.m. Uh, topic still yet to be determined, but mark your calendar because um, it, it will definitely be helpful. Uh, I am really thrilled to um, introduce our speakers today. Our presenters are co-hosts of a podcast called Mind in View. Dr. Thea Gallagher and Kate Breck. Thea is a licensed clinical psychologist and licensed professional counselor. And Kate is a mental health advocate who was treated for a severe case of OCD eight years ago at the Center for the Treatment and Study of Anxiety at the University of Pennsylvania, where Dr. Gallagher is the director of the outpatient clinic. Um, following her successful treatment, she started a support group at the center, which is where she met and got to know Thea, and uh, the group continues to meet monthly. So we're so excited to, um, to hear from them and really learn more about when it's more than just, more than just worried, uh, when anxiety is impacting your tween or teen. So with that, Kate or Thea, I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Um, Sophia is going to pull up a PowerPoint that we can use to guide our discussion while I just uh, give a brief uh, introduction. Thanks so much, Laura, for the lovely words. We're really excited to be here. Um, as Laura mentioned, uh, Thea is a clinician and has a lot of experience treating anxiety disorders, uh, which is how I know her as someone who was treated for an anxiety disorder. Um, we decided to start uh, our podcast at, primarily as a way to help break the stigma associated with anxiety, which tends to be uh, a real barrier to treatment, both for adults and for teens. And as someone who was an undiagnosed teenager myself, I was diagnosed with OCD at 30 years old. Um, I can tell you that uh, the fewer barriers there are and the more stories we have about young people getting the appropriate treatment, uh, the better off we are. We will all be. So I'm gonna, gonna go through a number of slides. Um, the first couple are more clinical, so I'm gonna leave that to the doctor. And then as we get into the meat of the presentation, uh, we'll sort of share our experiences. We tend to be pretty, um, 
uh, we we share a dialogue more than um, sort of speaking at you. So we'll do that amongst ourselves. And also, if there are any questions that come up um, over the course of this, please feel free to uh, throw them in the chat or uh, speak up with them uh, in breaks between slides or, or when appropriate. We're happy to, to have a dialogue with uh, everyone here. So Bia, you want to take it away with your official doctor slides mm -hmm. yeah, and we're just so happy to be here and to be talking to you and hopefully you can use and share this resource um, as you need uh, part of you know just kind of going back to even in us creating a podcast you know when I was looking at what kind of podcasts there were for mental health there's a lot that are like you know really didactic and heavy on the data and then there's others that are like you know people just talking about their day-to-day -day. and we wanted to find a way to both share you know clinically relevant data and research while also sharing our personal experiences. And, uh, you know, also I can, I can share that just because uh, you're a therapist doesn't mean that you've never or don't struggle with anxiety or depression, any of those symptoms. So I think kind of breaking that barrier that we can talk about these things. So just to kind of start, I'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, kind of anxiety and teens and tweens. We have seen in the pandemic, even with some of the early research, really showing that um, Gen Zers, millennials were really struggling, were, uh, you know, a vulnerable population. And it, you know, it makes sense when you think about this time in their lives is so important to connect with others um, and not having that. Um, you know, and, and extracurriculars and structure, all those things that, you know, for us as adults, we lost and it caused, we've seen an uptick in anxiety and depression for everyone, but specifically for teens and tweens, um, seeing, you know, a more vulnerable population, um, which is, I think, again, why this topic is so relevant and important. Um, and just to kind of, if you're like, what are, you know, the, the kind of anxiety and anxiety related disorders, we have like your general anxiety disorder where, you know, people who worry about a number of things and it kind of jumps around and it jumps to this thing and then it's that thing. Um, and then, you know, with OCD, we see more of people who show with intrusive thoughts and compulsive behaviors. And Kate can also speak to her experience of what that was like. Um, you know, also seeing people struggling with panic or somatic anxiety, that physiological anxiety. If you think back to, I always use the example of the first episode of The Sopranos and Tony Soprano goes to the hospital. He thinks he's dying. Um, he's actually having a panic attack. But just to indicate how, I, I use that example to just to indicate how strong that physiological response is. Um, and we do see that, especially in um, you know teens and tweens who don't necessarily have the verbiage to, to express their anxiety, sometimes it comes out in the body. Um, and sometimes it can be both. And, you know, we do see and we have seen that social anxiety, you know, it tends to develop around the teenage years and becomes more of a problem then. And the pandemic has been interesting because in some ways we've seen people struggle less with social anxiety, but part of that's because they've had less um, exposure to others. And that now that people are getting back to school, um, I'm treating a lot of people currently who are like getting back this re-entry anxiety about getting back to the things I used to do is really difficult. Um, and we're probably gonna see more of that with extracurriculars and social things because it just starts to feel awkward. Uh, and if there's one thing that a teen or tween hates, it's feeling awkward. So, um, and then, you know, we there, there are many, uh, teens who are undiagnosed, adolescents who are undiagnosed. And, you know, we'll talk about this, but you'll hear the phrase, oh, you know, it's just the teenage years, everyone struggles, hormonal changes, things like that. Um, where, yes, that can be a part of it, but there's also, it's really important to address um, symptoms of anxiety and depression. So again, why, why is this a stage where we tend to see an uptick in anxiety, depression, and then again, during the pandemic, um, you know, Eric Erickson was a, a psychologist and he, you know, kind of developed these, these different stages of development. And one of the ones he talked about for adolescents was identity versus role confusion, you know, figuring out who I am, what do I want to bring to the table? Um, you know, you'll see at certain parts, certain stages of adolescence, if you were to go to the mall, everyone's dressed exactly the same, right? And then you start to see that people start to dress completely different. 
Um, it's really about like fitting in, finding your unique voice, which can be a really stress. I mean, finding, figuring out kind of like the foundational aspects of your identity and, and uh, you know, sense of self is a really important thing that people, are, you know, that adolescents are doing. You know, also we see an uptick in, you know, bullying, uh, you know, us versus them, in group, out group. Um, that I, I think we have as, as adults as well, but we're more subtle about it. But, you know, adolescents can be really challenging and that especially um, can be pretty ruthless as all of us have seen in the news and, um, you know, with bullying and, and various uh, aspects of that. And then there's a lot of social evaluating, like where am I, where do I fit, am I popular, like which crowd am I in, can I find a group, can I find a home um, to be myself and what is myself. Uh, and, and so I think, again, it, it just has a lot of, there's a lot of aspects to just this, this season of life that can make it so difficult. And then specifically with the pandemic, you know, people feeling more isolation, especially, you know, hard for teens who, again, are, you know, it's such an important part of their lives to interact with each other, to kind of to be building those friendships, starting to think about romantic relationships, all these things that are developmentally appropriate. Um, it's a real time of, again, building relationships, finding your self-worth. And really, you know, I think if you could, the thematic question on the stage is, really, who am I? Um, and and who, who are my role models? Who do I want to bring to the table? Um, who do I think I should be? Who am I told I should be? Uh, and, and, you know, when we, I think it, it's easy to feel far removed from that time in our lives. But when we look back, we remember that there were, you know, a lot of tears uh, and, and, you know, moments of feeling, feeling pretty, pretty desperate. So again, this population has specific risks that aren't just, you know, um, you know, kept to the, the risks of maybe your more general anxiety symptoms, we actually, we do see an uptick in suicidal ideation, suicidal behaviors, uh, self-harm, you know, avoidance, and we know avoidance leads to greater anxiety, can lead to more isolation, can lead to greater feelings of uh, depression, which again, lead to isolation, feeling alone, and then you feel alone because you are alone. And uh, that 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 cycle of depression tends to get worse, and then also we can see some some risky behaviors with kind of caring less, um, and and those behaviors can also be be really concerning when we're thinking even about prefrontal cortex development, uh, and and a lot of times teenagers and and tweens they're not thinking about long term consequences to certain actions and behaviors. So um, it's both you know. It, the, these mental health, like these mental health concerns that we have, can also lead to uh, physical physical health problems in the long run. Too, again, kind of going back to the fact that these are so intricately linked. Um, and Kate, I know you're going to talk more about your your story, but um, you know, can you speak to any of these that you experienced as an adolescent with um, you know an undiagnosed anxiety disorder? I sure can. Um, you know, starting at the top, I thought a lot about dying. I thought a lot about killing myself. Um, not necessarily making a plan. I wasn't necessarily trying to die, um, but I definitely had a lot of sort of what I refer to now with hindsight as sort of existential crises. I would wake up every morning and think, why am I alive if this is what I feel like if this is the hand I've been dealt, I couldn't see past um, the life I was living. Um, it led to um, avoidance. I definitely had a lot of social isolation um, and I was diagnosed with depression as part of my journey with OCD. That was sort of the first aspect of my diagnosis was the depression that was caused by the OCD. So. Um, it can cause any number of these in any in any uh, combination, um, and it can be really scary for both a teenager who's not really sure what they're going through and a parent to watch their kid experience things like, hey, I wish I weren't alive, um, or, or to sort of retreat from their lives and their friends. Yeah, and that can be a really scary place for parents to be. And we're going to talk a lot about that. You know, do I talk about it? Do I not talk about it? Do, do I make it worse? I've had parents come to me saying, like, I saw, you know, my daughter's social media posts and now I'm worried. I don't know what's going on. 
Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, recommended ways to address some of these, you know, these signs or, or even some of these behaviors. So part of the, you know, a big thing that, that we're constantly up against both as clinicians or people who have benefited from mental health treatment or all of us, you know, in our families, our cultures, our family of origin, um, is mental health stigma. And, you know, we're seeing major improvements with people being able to talk about these things. You know, we've seen prominent athletes and celebrities come forward saying, you know, I struggle with my mental health and um, it can be really powerful. But some of the, you know, some of the messages that are still lingering are, you know, ideas like I'm weak, I'm crazy, I'm a burden. Uh, and, you know, those kind of thoughts lead to more isolation, lead to not seeking help, lead to, you know, again, thinking, thinking you're, you're on your own and that nothing can be done. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I'll be rejected. I'm unlovable. I'm alone in this. There's no way out. Um, I think one stigma that pretty much anybody of any age with uh, any kind of mental health disorder has is that they're broken. They think they're broken and um, that everyone else seems to have it better. Uh, I think that's something that also is ubiquitous to sort of the teenage years. I think when um, you're experiencing a drama of any kind when you're a teen, it definitely does also feel like everyone else has it somehow easier, even if it's not to the level of a mental health or an anxiety disorder. It just is turned up to 1000 when you are a teenager with a mental health disorder, uh, feeling like there's no way out. Um, that's sort of where my suicidal ideation came from as a teenager, feeling like this is it. This is the life I get. I don't see any further than this. Um, and there's no end. And it can be really, really frightening. And the stigma sort of builds upon itself because then um, there's shame and the shame causes silence and the silence causes, you know, no, no help because nobody else really knows or you, you don't feel like you can confide in anyone who can provide a service or support to you. Yeah, and you know, I, I've done a lot of uh, interviews in the media about TikTok and social media and teens and tweens, and I think it's easy to fall on the idea that it's all bad, it, you know, it's creating this culture that's so you know, toxic, but there, there can be really great outlets on social media like for breaking mental health stigma, but at the same time, there is equally as bad of like, you know, seeing my friends in, you know, in like looking like they're living the perfect life and they're so skinny yeah. and they're so perfect and they're out, you know, on, they're just on vacation all summer. And then I talk to those same kids, you know, in my office and they're struggling. And so I think, I think there's this tension between like, I have to look like I have to have it all together, but I want to, I, I want to know there's other people like me, but I can't break the stigma and I have to keep playing the game and wearing the mask. So, um, you know, I think, you know, thinking about there, there can be some really great social media and internet resources, but I think that some of the, the stuff that's, you know, kind of the face validity that you see in Instagram and TikTok can also um, reinforce some of these mental health stigmas that everyone else has it perfect and I'm the only one struggling. Mm -hmm. And I think there's less awareness that everyone is only putting their best selves out there. It feels even more lonely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I think it's, it's, and I think even as adults, it's pretty common that if we're on, you know, any form of social media, we're not really posting like about like, you know, your toddler threw all up, threw up in the car and stuff like, cause you're like, no one wants to read that, but you realize that the, you know, then what people see about your life, it's easy to idealize. Um, and that can kind of reinforce stigma that people, everyone's just killing it at life. And I'm over here struggling alone. Um, so what ways do we, you know, as adults and parents sometimes reinforce stigma? Um, you know, and I, and I always tell patients and their parents, I think your, you know, your parents are coming from a well-meaning place. And with most parents, they're coming from a well-meaning place too. Like, you're fine. It's a way of saying like, you're going to be okay. But the kind of the you're fine, um, I think it's also trying to like convince your child that they're doing okay, but it can also be really dismissing um, and it can reinforce more hiding and more shame and more isolation. Uh, also, you know, people have it worse than you, like, look at your life, I'm doing all these things for you. And again, I think that why a lot of parents say that is, you know, because 
they, they feel guilty. They don't, they don't want it to be some reflection of their parenting choices or something that they have done. And they, they also want their kids to feel good. So it, it's normal, I think, to say things like that and they're not coming from a bad place. Um, and then, you know, you're just attention seeking or I have had parents who they're not going to say that to their kid's face, but they're going to tell me they're going to come in my office later and be like, I just think like she really needs attention. And I always remind them if you're, if you think your child needs attention, that's also a data. That's a data point. Um, if, if, you know, that's not necessarily, that doesn't mean like, oh, they're fine. If they are seeking attention, they're asking for something, they're needing something, they're, they're trying to communicate in some way. So try to look below the waterline, try to see what's actually happening and what's actually going on. And then also there are times where, you know, that the patient really isn't trying to seek attention. They are, they are truly struggling. Um, and one of the things I want to mention here is that a lot of times, um, especially on the younger end with kids and, and tweens who are struggling with really bad anxiety, um, you know, it can look like they're attention seeking if they're hyperventilating or having like really strong physiological reactions or, or a lot of emotions um, around certain situations. And just remember that anxiety disorders can be truly that powerful that, you know, your, your child is not exaggerating how they're feeling. They're just trying to express to you what's really going on. Um, and some of this might even feel totally out of their control. Mm -hmm. Um, you were happy just yesterday. You know, this reminds me of some conversations that I've had. I do in a lot, in my advocacy work, I talk a lot to people with OCD or in, in this particular case, I talked to both a parent and a teenager who, um, were struggling with the teenager's case of OCD. And, you know, the parent reached out to me and asked for my advice and then said, would you talk to my child? And one of the things that struck me about my conversation with the parent was that um, they were really angry by the inconsistency of the anxiety of the OCD in this case. And sometimes you do seem okay, or you might have a good day. Um, they also sort of talked about how they didn't feel like their child was trying hard enough to be happy as though it's something that you can um, sort of turn on or off. So there are myths even, and this was a parent who's very well-meaning, who really wanted to help their child and who was dedicated to getting the support they needed, but still there were sort of some of these baked in um, misunderstandings of the journey that their child was on. And, and part of it was sort of judging their mood uh, day by day. And certainly people can have different moods on different days, but if, if something is a true anxiety disorder, um, it will come to the surface. And, and sometimes you can be, um, you know, compartmentalizing. I have a lot of experience doing that personally, um, or, or faking it. A lot of times people with anxiety disorders are faking lots of our day uh, because we want to seem more baseline than we are. Um, therapy is for people who are crazy. This is one that I have seen a generational shift in. You know, when I was younger, I remember, um, you know, a lot of mental health disorders can be genetic. Some of them are, some of them aren't, but in OCD in particular, in my experience and in the anecdotal um, evidence from the work I do in advocacy, it does seem to run in families. And I definitely have extended family members who have mental illnesses. And their mother, my grandmother would say, you know, shake it off, or you, you can just be happy. You know, a lot of what Thea shared was like, people have it worse than you. There are people in other countries who are suffering, or are you still going through that? Are you still in that sad thing? Um, and I saw my um, relatives really suffer from that um, perspective. And I think we're seeing a little bit less of that, but I do think there's still some of the stigma of, you, I don't want to put my child in therapy because they're not bad enough, quote unquote, or they're not, um, they don't have something um, that sort of rises to the level of needing a diagnosis. And as somebody who um, thoroughly <laughs> benefits from being in therapy, whether I'm in a mental health crisis or not, um, I think sort of reducing the stigma to just, you need somebody to talk to that's not your parent or your friend. You just need somebody whose job is to, um, to, to prioritize what you care about for an hour a week or whatever it is um, and help you get through it. I think that that can make a really big difference. Um, on that, I've had parents yeah. who have gotten mad at me 
um, as a therapist, like, kind of like, why can't my kid just talk to me? Why do they have to talk to you? Why do I have to pay for this? And I, and I go back to them, you know, I have a young daughter and I imagine one day she's not going to want to talk to me about what's going on, you know, in parts of her life. And that'll be very normal and appropriate. So I think it can also, you know, it's really nice for them to have a person who is not connected with their life and not going to be disappointed by like choices they've made or ways they're feeling. And there's less of that burden on them. So I think, um, you know, instead of taking it like personally, they can talk to somebody and not me seeing it as a blessing of something that you can offer a professional service that can also, um, you know, help them to debrief and to, to process some of their emotions of their life without like, I, I find that a lot of teens, they don't want to disappoint their parents. They don't want to make yeah. them upset or share too much to like, I'm going to make them sad. So I would, again, it's, it's easy to look at that stuff, take it personally, but kind of looking out um, for that as like kind of a, a, an offering that can be really beneficial for your child. Mm -hmm. And also uh, there are a lot of manifestations of OCD in particular that cause a lot of shame. And, uh, you know, I remember thinking about, you know, there was a knife on the counter when I was a teenager. And I thought, what if I killed my dog with this knife? And I wasn't about to be like, mom, hey, guess what? I just thought about killing Maggie. Isn't that interesting? You know, I, I tucked it away and I thought, oh my gosh, there must be something wrong with me. And I, you know, got really anxious and I went through a cycle of obsessions and compulsions and I didn't know. And if I had had, you know, a therapist help and I had any kind of perspective on what was going on, I think I would have um, felt a little bit more comfortable and even just understanding what it is that might be going on. Sometimes a professional is the best one to, to share that. Um, and then finally, teens being teens, um, the idea of, you know, uh, they're just being dramatic or they're not talking to me because they're, you know, they're just angry. They're just, you know, they're holed up in their room because they're, um, you know, on their computer or whatever. And I think as parents, um, you can tell, I think when it's typical teenage behavior and when it feels like it has a little bit of a different flavor. Um, and I think, what are the norms of your child? What are, what do they normally um, seem like? How do they act? Are there things that you're noticing are slightly different? Um, are, are their moods more, more uh, dramatic in a way that feels concerning? Um, and, you know, it, it helps to write it off as teens being teens sometimes, and sometimes that's what it is. But um, if you start to notice a pattern, I think of your particular teen uh, being an anomaly in, in their behavior, I think that's when it's time to maybe have a conversation. Yeah, and going back to our, like a couple slides before, teens being teens, if you're again, thinking about that developmental stage, being a teen is hard, you know? And so, um, you know, even seeing it, it's not just a write off, even if that is the case, how do we meet them where they're at? How do we make sure to attend to, um, you know, again, this vulnerable population that needs more from us than less? Mm -hmm. So we were gonna talk a little bit about kind of our own journeys in adolescence and just to give context to, you know, what we struggled with. So Kate, do you wanna talk a little bit here? Sure. Um, so I've mentioned a few things about my um, early sort of undiagnosed OCD. I'll just back it up a little bit with uh, I came from an Irish Catholic family and worrying is part of the DNA in that kind of a family environment. Um, so it was very normal that anxiety was just a way of showing love, honestly. Um, when I think about it, it was a love language, was worrying about people. And so I learned that very young. Um, my OCD started to click on in ways that didn't uh, prove to be paralyzing. I didn't have a serious um, life altering um, sort of life pausing case of OCD until my mid 20s. But in my teens and actually a little bit earlier, my tweens, I saw some looking back, I see some behaviors that were definitely the beginnings of my OCD. For example, uh, when I was about 10, I used to feel really compelled to say goodnight to my family. I had to say goodnight to them all. I couldn't miss anyone. And if they were going out and I wasn't, you know, I was going to bed, my brother and sister were, you know, significantly older, like they were teens and I was a kid. Um, I had to say it before they went out, if I knew they weren't going to be home before I went to bed. And I had to say this sort of laundry list of things. It was it was like, good night, I love you, infinity, et cetera. There was like some God bless you or something in there. And I shortened it to night, love you, night, et cetera. And I had to say it, it had to feel exactly, like I just said it and it didn't feel exactly right. And I, you know, like the, the part of me that OCD will always be there um, 
was sort of like, you should say it again. Um, you know, going back to my, you know, my tween self and I would say it until it felt right. And, um, I had to say it. And if I, if I somehow missed a person, I was, I was extremely anxious about it. Um, the situation with my dog, I mentioned, you know, one of my primary manifestations of OCD is fear of harming people and, um, that kind of OCD and some of the other more sort of violent obsessions. There's obsessions about being a pedophile. Um, there's obsessions about, um, you know, religious things because they're not as, um, typically shared in the media. Uh, you know, I wasn't washing my hands. I wasn't like turning the stove off. Um, that was one of the gaps in knowledge, both of myself, of my family recognizing what I was going through and of, serve, of clinical providers. I was misdi not misdiagnosed, but um, if you want to listen to the podcast, listen to my episode, there was a, there was a truly harmful experience that I had with a psychiatrist and their um, lack of understanding of what I was going through. Um, so Add that layer on to a regular awkward teenager who um, was I was bullied pretty pretty significantly, um, and I I I think some of the reasons were that um, I was with with a group of kids. I went to Catholic school, and the group of kids was together for eight years. And I think something about that period of time it just felt like people started to get sick of each other. Uh, clicks changed. People knew too much about each other and um, I, you know, and they knew everything about you. And I went through a growth spurt where I went sideways before I went vertical and I started to get bullied about that. I was also really, um, I was quiet and I was well-behaved and I wasn't going to fight back. And so I became a pretty easy target and I internalized a lot of that. And at its core, OCD is also a bully. It's your internal bully. And so I, I struggled a lot with, um, with trying to sort of retain my own identity or even just figure out my identity in the context of um, both this OCD that was undiagnosed as of yet and these human bullies telling me all the ways I wasn't ever gonna fit in and that I was wrong somehow and that um, I was less than. And so that was sort of what I was up against as I entered my high school years and then college and so on. And um, it caused a, it caused a significant um, sort of um, I call it recovery. You know, throughout high school, I was very withdrawn, socially isolated, um, and I think a lot of it was sort of I was recovering from that without the tools to to truly do so with um, with support. I had a, a loving, supportive family. I had some friends um, who accepted me for who I was, but I didn't have sort of an understanding of what it was that had sort of hit me. And so it definitely, um, you know, I still have to kind of go in and find some of these things sometimes when I'm in therapy and I'll be like, oh, um, you know, the therapist will say, well, well, tell me about the first time you felt that way that is, you know, resulting in this current behavior. And I'm like, oh, shoot, <laughs> you know, we got to go back to my teenage years. Um, so it can have a really long term impact. And I don't say that to scare anybody um, as much as to say that what we go through in our teenage years um, can certainly have a long leash and, and isn't, you know, um, isn't for it isn't just sort of stuff we'll get over or move past necessarily. And, and it, it deserves attention. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and again, I would encourage if you want to hear, these are like the trailers to our stories, but if you want to hear more about kind of what we've both been through and in the long form version, you can listen to the, the, the first two uh, full episodes of our podcast. So I'll just briefly kind of, I want to make sure we get to some solution focused or, or strategies for, for helping teens and tweens. But um, you know, I, I can just say, you know, I don't think anybody probably in this Zoom call like got through adolescence unscathed. Uh, you know, I had a fraught family life. My parents were get, got divorced when I was an adolescent. My sister throughout my entire adolescence was battling cancer. Um, and just kind of, I think my ways of controlling my life since there was a lot that was out of control was being, you know, perfectionistic. Uh, and so I'm like a recovering perfectionist, but there's a lot, there's a lot of anxiety that came with all of these things. And I think for some of us, how we manage our anxiety is when we can't control our external world, we try to control our internal world, um, which, you know, that's just not how life works. And so it can end up causing more anxiety and trying to, you know, be the person that society wants you to be and trying to like 
fit in all these boxes. Um, and, you know, it's still something that I am, you know, working through even in, you know, is somebody in their mid thirties now working through that with even employers and friends, um, you know, realizing how that had an impact. So just kind of, I think, um, and we'll talk about kind of what we wished was there for us and what we wish people had told us or could have, you know, and I think we both had some really great protective factors of certain supportive people and, and areas to process through this stuff. But, um, you know, also I think just remembering that it is a, like Kate says, has a long leash. Um, and so some of the coping strategies, like what, what really helps, like, and, and, you know, this is what we found in the data and the research. And I think all of us can speak to, we've seen it work for ourselves and for others uh, that we, that, you know, other adolescents, but having that support system is really important. Um, and, you know, trying to be that support system and a support system, I think really means just being available, being, you know, being, being there to talk and to kind of unconditional positive regard we'll talk about, but really kind of showing up and, and being there. Um, and this can come from, you know, peers, siblings, parents. Um, and so I think helping children to also have, have those connections and have it from various resources can be really important. Also, I think it's really important for teens and tweens to connect with other like-minded individuals, people who have the same interest in them, you know, um, finding other people who like to do theater or art or sports and, and really kind of making those connections. They've, they've done some research even on um, kids who play team sports and how there's a, you know, there's a, a, a less, um, less symptoms of anxiety. I think just feeling like you're in something together, that camaraderie, that connection. Yeah, and on that, I also, I, I attribute some of my healing to having been old enough to get a part-time job and just sort of realizing that there were other people who had, who were my age, who lived in the area, who were struggling with similar things and weren't in my small corner of the world. Um, it helped me to understand that um, those existential crises about where's the end of this? How am I going to get out of this? It, it was a little bit more like, oh gosh, I actually, there are other people out there that might like me or get along, I might get along with in a different way. And, you know, we weren't all, you know, working at CVS because we like loved the pharmacological arts, but it was something where we were a bunch of kids who were motivated and, and interested in, you know, having weekend, um, weekend cash and, and just having that. So both like-minded individuals and sort of other peers from different worlds who you can get to know in a totally different way that aren't already in your sphere. Um, for me, a really big uh, part of my healing was in art, artistic expression. Um, I took up painting, I actually ended up going to college for it. I, um, I had a very musical brother who was in bands and I would basically follow him around. I went to all of his shows. They were all ages shows because his bandmates were all young. And there was something about, again, being in an environment where there are other people who weren't in my, who weren't going to bully me, who weren't um, in my circle that were also different, you know, they were kind of like the different kids where they were because they were into music and the arts and we were all able to kind of come together and enjoy um, something different and an artistic expression. Um, I also took up journaling. I journaled everything. I, it was just train of thought. I would get out a lot of my anger, my frustration. I would write poetry or whatever it was. Um, most of it never shared, but it just get it out of my head. Um, and talking about it, you know, and talking about it both um, amongst your friends, parents, whatever kind of support system they have. Um, but also I would add to this um, positive self-talk is really, really critical. And it was something that I discovered. I don't remember how I discovered it, but I remember one day looking in the mirror and I realized that everything I was saying to myself was a regurgitation of what the bullies were saying to me, both human and mental, you know, my mental illness. And I just thought, no, I'm going to try and find three things about myself that I appreciate or that I'm proud of today and, um, and, and sort of stop engaging in the negative self-talk. And I'm going to look in the mirror and I'm going to, I'm going to 
be the person who stands up for me if no one else is going to do that. And I think that that was really critical to my healing. And it, it was the first step in me being able to actually talk to other people about it was sort of getting the words out on my own, both on paper um, and um, in our art and, and then um, to others. Yeah, and I think talking about that negative self-talk is so important. One of the first interventions I usually do with patients is that I, you know, I say, you have to say five things you like about yourself or five things you're good at, even objectively, uh, that have nothing to do with your physical appearance. And it can be really hard. Sometimes that can take up like a whole session or sometimes they have to go home for homework. They got to work on that. Another thing I do when I meet with their parents, you know, because their parents can come and say they're not doing this, they're not doing this, focusing on all the things they're not doing. I also tell their parents, give me some strengths that you see in your child. Um, and I think that's really important to have that mindset for all of us. It's so easy for us to, you know, drift toward the negative about ourselves, about our kids, about, you know, it's, it, that's the easiest thing to do. It's so much harder for us sometimes to see uh, the positives. Um, and we, you know, Kate and I were kind of uh, just thinking about all the things that we wish we could have said to our teenage self. And if we had more time, I would even ask you to chime in on what you think, but just some of the things to, to kind of remember. Uh, and I think this is a good exercise again, to think like, what, what do I wish I could say to my teenage self? And, and some of the ones we were thinking of is like, you know, the world is bigger than it feels. You're worthy. Everyone's as scared as you are. Um, you can change and, you know, you won't feel this way forever. Yeah, that was a big one that I would have wanted to tell myself is, you know, you won't feel this way forever. You don't need to have existential crises and imagine your funeral instead of your sweet 16. Um, you will be better um, one day. You will figure out how to manage this. Um, also, so important, but I think that in, in, in well-intentioned, um, the sort of uh, you'll be fine area of trying to make sure someone knows that they're that they won't feel this way forever I think sometimes we can accidentally invalidate feelings um, so just acknowledging like yeah this I can see how this feels really crummy and you know I'm really sorry that you're experiencing this even if it's seemingly minor or seemingly drama um, that is sort of just teenager stuff. I think just validating that those feelings are real and that they're, your child's feeling them. Um, also the decisions you make at 14, 15, 16 aren't set in stone. I think there's a lot of pressure. I remember feeling a lot of pressure as a teen and I, I see it reflected in the teenagers in my life that um, especially as they get into high school age where it's like, where are you going to go to college? That that's the whole rest of your life. What are you going to major in? That's your whole career. What, you know, who are you going to date? That's who you're going to marry. And all of these things feel you're sort of all of a sudden old enough to make decisions that feel really big. And before all your decisions were sort of made for you or were heavily influenced, you know, where you go to high school, you may be, you get to choose between two or three places or, um, you know, what you do on the weekends, of course, or who your friends are, but all of a sudden you're making these big life decisions. And I think the pressure of that can be really paralyzing if you're not used to it, or if it just feels like too much. And I think that can, I've seen that trigger anxiety disorders just sort of come alive in certain uh, people. Um, this idea that all of a sudden decisions are really important. Um, but the thing is, I, I have taken the, the, the track of, I make one decision, without knowing what the next 10 are, because I think there's an, in, there's this inclination that we have not to step forward until we know what the whole path is and stepping forward and then kind of looking around and saying, okay, what's the weather like over here? And you might even see, see options that you hadn't seen before. I went to school for painting and I do not work as a full-time painter um, 20 years later. So I can tell you for sure, those decisions are not set in stone you can change on that note. Um, if you feel that you need to evolve out of something, you have every ability to. When the bullies were telling me that I was always gonna be this you know, dorky, overweight kid, I didn't understand that I could grow out of that until I told myself I could. Um, and then be, being gentle with yourself. Um, again, you know, in some of my um, advocacy work, in talking with teenagers, there's this, 
there's this um, tendency to sort of beat themselves up and say like, I know I'm disappointing my parents that I can't get better. Or I, I know I want to do this, but my parents want me to do that. And I just don't even know what to do. And I don't know where to start. And I'm, I'm failing. And it's like being gentle with yourself and letting yourself both as a parent and as a teenager, everybody needs more compassion in the scenario um, that everybody's doing the best with what they've got and trying to figure out what those resources are versus blaming ourselves for what we're not doing right. Um, it goes it goes into the positive self-talk and all of that, but um, just really remembering that, you know, I deserve love. Absolutely. And just to kind of think about what what you can do as a parent it's hard not to take things personally i mentioned this or as a reflection of one's own success or failure as a parent and i'm always encouraging parents like you know what we know about adolescent research is that there's like this line and then there's like a bunch of stuff we don't fully understand and then there's another line after and what they've really found is what you kind of put in on the front end tends to match up with what happens on the back end. So just kind of remembering who you are as a parent and what you've done and what you've offered you're not going to be perfect but that's not you know, kind of a message you need to be sending your kid anyway, you know, life isn't about being perfect, but I think trying to see them as unique individuals who are struggling in different ways um, and trying to be there for them um, instead of kind of saying like, well, this is some, like, I feel guilty because this makes me look bad. And then that's when people avoid it, and then they don't have those conversations. Um, you know, there can be, you know, I, I see on both sides, parents being too involved, like policing decisions, um, and then not, in, you know, not involved enough, like being dismissive um, with the policing. And it can be like, you're, you're stressed, or you're not looking good, or you need to do this, or you need to do this, or you need to make sure you're eating right, or going to bed, like, you know, where it gets, you know, you, you want to encourage this autonomy. But then it can be also like not being involved enough, like, oh, they just have to figure this out for themselves. So trying to find that balance and the, you know, the data show that the best kind of type of parent is one with high expectations and high love. And so if you can find a way to have both of those things together, um, that's really that sweet spot. And then reminding ourselves how hard it was. Again, it's amazing how far removed we can be. And then you see a picture or you remember a memory from the past and you remember how hard it was for you. So try to tap into that. That really helps to build empathy. Um, and then, you know, sometimes we can push too hard and, and make, you know, our kids do things they don't want to do. But sometimes it's, it's important to like, to teach them also how to like follow through with something that they did commit to or do it a couple times, at least try it. Um, and that's, something as like an exposure based therapist for anxiety. I'm always encouraging parents, you know, it, you know, if you take your kid to the hip hop class and they've really wanted to do it, but now they're scared, how do you help them to like do it anyway? Um, even if you are scared, but finding that balance of like not making them like have a volleyball career just because you had one. So finding that balance, like what's best for my kid, but how can I encourage them also to face their fears and to like, and to learn from that as well. And then just that unconditional positive regard, really like, you know, most parents want to love their kids unconditionally, but it's easy that when they're disappointing us, it's easy how conditional that can feel. So really working on how do I present that um, to my child. Mm -hmm. And on the sort of balance between the policing and the dismissive, you don't have to go back, but it just reminded me actually of um, uh, an episode that we did on the podcast where um, we interviewed a, a parent of a young child who had gone through OCD treatment. And one of the examples she gave was that when she learned that one of the things you're supposed to do is, um, is sort of stop the child from seeking reassurance or from stopping behaviors, um, the child would start to do her compulsions. And one of them was asking questions. And, um, you know, our, the mother would say, um, you know, I'm not going to answer questions for 10 minutes. And and the child got really mad and really upset. And they went back, you know, in the next session, the doctor was like, well, try 20 seconds first. You know, the idea of there's a balance there and you've got to find it. And um, part of it is putting the effort in and learning as you go. Um, so on to the sort of more solution, the things that can be helpful. I don't know if we have any other Ted Lasso fans out here, but Thea and I are big fans and we love the sort of central tenet of that show that is being curious rather than judgmental. It can help in every facet of life um, as a parent as well, um, trying to, to look at um, difficulties or various circumstances from a place of 
why might this be happening? Or even from our own feelings, why am I reacting to my child's behavior this way? Um, what might this be coming from? Is this something that might potentially be different than what it is I'm interpreting? Is Am I maybe interpreting it through my own lens of something? Um, Leading by example, we can do hard things. I noticed you you added Glennon Doyle in here too. <laughs> um, so uh, Fee and I are fan in the fan club of, of a number of different things. Um, but the idea we can do hard things, me personally, it's be afraid and do it anyway. Something that I learned over the years um, is that you can be afraid and still do something. Um, and that's, you know, OCD is really about fear. And so for me, that was really a mind blowing moment of, oh, wait, the fear doesn't actually have to stop me. Because I think that we spend so much time um, trying to uh, stop people that we love from feeling unpleasant feelings. We want to get them off of them. Um, and so, which leads into the next idea of tolerating your child's anxiety without trying to fix it. Um, I think it's about, you know, I remember a lot of times being told, don't cry, don't be sad. Um, instead of, you know, why might you be sad? Why are you crying? Those feelings are okay. Um, and I actually, I have a friend who one day said to me, you know, all, all parents tell me that they want their kids to be happy and that's their main priority. My priority for my kids isn't that they're happy, it's that they're resilient because I know they're not always gonna be happy and I can't guarantee that. And if I try to tell them they always have to be happy, that might actually harm them um, because I need them to be able to deal with the stuff that sucks. And, and notice when the stuff is good and be grateful for that. And so it's the idea of sort of tolerating that as a parent, as well as letting your child feel, um, you know, certain anxious feelings. There are certain things that obviously need intervention, but um, learning to sort of tolerate it. Um, showing up for your kid. You know, I think a lot of times um, it's about the memories that we have as kids and teenagers are, are just having people in our corner. Um, and inviting conversation. Um, if there's a different behavior, if there's a, a sort of blow up, if there's something that's an anomaly, um, or if your child comes to you and says that they're feeling something, inviting conversation in a curious way. Um, that, you know, that involves listening, um, being less uh, inclined to offer examples of other people's lives um, who may be are harder or, oh, but they, they don't seem unhappy and they had the same experience that you did. Or, um, or if there's a, a situation, you know, there are, God forbid something happens with like a suicide in a school, bringing that up. How did that make you feel? Did you know that kid? Or, or even if it's just in the news, Hey, I saw this in the news. Do you feel similarly? Do you, do you see any of this amongst your friends? Inviting conversations, whether it be um, if it feels a little too close to home, start with something that's a little bit further, it's a little bit more news and bring it up and, and see if they'll sort of take the bait um, and, and have a conversation with you about something theoretically um, that will eventually potentially lead to having more specific conversations about how they feel or how their friends might be experiencing the world. Yeah, one of the interventions I've had uh, when I have like the patient and the, the parent in the room, as soon as they make the parent like share a situation in their life that was tough or that like, you know, like maybe what they thought was like a perceived failure or a job they didn't get or an opportunity that didn't happen and like how they dealt with it. Because I think it can be easy when you get to that place where you're the parent and the child, you're telling them how to do things and this is how you do it, but you're, you're not coming across as a human that you've struggled too. And here's yeah. how I worked through that. And that can be so powerful for kids to see like, oh my gosh, my parents struggled too because they, you know, your parents seem larger than life at those ages. So I think inviting conversation, even by sharing your own struggles um, can be really powerful, it can, but it can also feel kind of counterintuitive. So we have, you know, exhausted our time. I know we probably only have a couple minutes for questions, but we wanted to leave them there if you wanted to ask a few. <coughs> um, we have a note from someone saying, wow, this is so good to hear. Thank you so much. Of in course. The chat. So. It was Fia, really excellent. Do you want to leave it on our contact information for the last few minutes? Mm -hmm. um, I do have a quick question. Well, I don't know if it's quick. I have a question. Um, you know, some of the folks that we, um, some of the folks that may be joining us on, on this webinar, folks that we work with are foster parents. We have social workers who are going into homes and helping 
um, maybe not necessarily in the, um, you know, in the mental health realm, they're helping stabilize more um, concrete goods, needs, household management, those sorts of things. But they're around kids, they're around teenagers, they're observing family dynamics. Some of us are, are aunts and uncles to teens. Um, do you have suggestions in those circumstances where you may, you're, you are a responsible and caring adult in a kid's life, but not the parent, and you see some things that are concerning. Um, suggestions on how how to approach that. What you know. What what we can what we can do. Is the question like how to approach the child or how to approach like the family system? I, or? I guess either. I guess either because I would imagine it. It sort of depends on what your role is relative to the family. Relative, you know, a yeah. coach who's coaching a kid is going to be different than uh, a close family friend right? Yeah. There, there'll be different approaches. I think it depends on the nature of the concern. You know, if you're concerned, like, hey, they're, they're, they're really showing like suicidal behavior, you know, sure. you might go directly to like the, the, you know, parental figure or the guardian or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. or you are the guardian and you might say like, I got to reach out to like some, you know, a mental health professional or the crisis center. I think if you're, um, you know, if you're, if you're saying I'm seeing some concerning behavior and I, and I want to be there, I think I always kind of use the approach of let's remember that it's like me and the, you know, you and your family against your anxiety. So kind of not making the patient feel like judged or, mm -hmm. or, you know, like I, I'm like, I, I think there's a fine line between like concern and judgment and really making sure mm -hmm. that you're showing concern um, in a way that's empathic and like truly about caring and not just like, oh, you know, like uh, you, you, you know, I saw this post that you did on, on Instagram about how you're like really struggling and what was that all about? And like, you don't want to again, be like the police, but really saying like, I really do want to know. And I, and I love the phrase, like people don't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care. And I'm sure for many of you who are going into, you know, homes where you might feel uninvited or, or if you're just trying to reach, you know, a kid where they're at and you're not like their biological parental figure I'm sure there mm -hmm. can be a lot of cliches and you know about like get, you know you're not my real parent or who are you to speak into my life but I think if you show it in a way that like truly like people can feel that and they know that you're really trying to care and sometimes actually you have a more unique position I know for me you know my ballet instructors you know when I was growing up they 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 were more powerful in my life than even some of my peers because they were there for me you know when my parents were you know having to attend to other things and so I think sometimes looking at your role as an opportunity um and Kate I don't know if you want to briefly speak to maybe like the people or the the systems or the way that you felt cared for yeah, and I'll just share actually from my perspective as an aunt to two teenage girls, one of whom has an anxiety disorder and one of whom um, is a clone of me. <laughs> um, and um, they're actually two different ones. The one with the anxiety disorder is not the clone of me, and odd, oddly enough. Um, but for me, I've noticed that the, the, the younger one has a tendency to sort of seem and feel alone in her family because there's they they sort of the the rest of them are cut very much from the same cloth and then there's this other the sort of youngest child which is also a place I held in my family I can see her wanting to be more independent or try different things and feeling um, a little bit uh, I think intimidated by that because she doesn't have an example so for me it's about showing up and being a non-judgmental adult in their lives. If the one who has anxiety wants to talk to me, I'm available to her and she knows that as well. Um, but also in those more subtle ways where I can see that there's sort of this feeling of not fitting in, that um, I, I want her to have an example of somebody who kind of seems more like what she might aspire to versus um, the sort of lifestyle that the rest of her family prefers, You know, the sort of more traditional, conventional. And so sometimes it's about just showing up um, and being there and, and being who you are, um, sharing your story, sharing your own vulnerability. Um, and, you know, to Thea's question, when I was that age, something about, um, you know, going to a musical performance or, or visiting my sister at college and having groups of people who... I didn't know, but who I saw through these absolute rose colored glasses of like worshipful, oh my gosh, cool older kids. 
um, were kind to me, e even just super simply were kind to me and asked how I was doing and treated me like I belonged or like that I was worthy. That can be a really good start is just treating the, the kids and the teens like they're worthy and they might, some of them might come to you. And if not, um, they might just see you as an example and that can help in ways you don't ever really even understand. But that's on the sort of low risk end of things, you know, as Thea mentioned, certain scenarios are certainly a little bit more um, high risk and, and, and need the appropriate intervention. Sure. That's great. That's really helpful. Um, another question that I have, and I, I don't know how much you, you folks have, have dealt with schools in particular. Um, I think it, things have gotten much better. Schools are much more aware of the behavioral health component, the need, you know, we, at every time we have a school-based program where we're in the classroom sometimes with kiddos and we, we provide a safe place for them to go. But I think for teens, one of the challenges and one of the things that we hear a lot are really this, this concern of keeping, keeping the school and the academic um, kind of venue separate from whatever the behavioral health or you know, whether it's they're going to therapy, they're going to counseling, what, addressing their diagnosis and really keeping that separate. Um, for a lot of valid reasons that are related to stigma and not wanting, um, you know, as, as kids are getting older and they're thinking about where they're going next, I, I know we, we see parents that are concerned about, we don't want this to follow a kid, right? So how, when you're working with, with parents, how do you help them address sometimes that dichotomy where you want uh, main, maintaining privacy and that privacy is not the same thing as, as stigma and being be, being open and unashamed of the supports that you might need. I'm not asking this very well, but. <laughs> no, I get what you're saying. And I think yeah. like, I worked um, as a psychologist, like as part of a truancy program. And it was really interesting because yeah. we found out a lot of the kids with school refusal and tru tru truancy was like anxiety. It's huge, yeah, it's yeah. a huge issue, yeah. And they get stigmatized, like they just don't want to go to school. And so, mm -hmm. like, um, you know, and a lot of like that, that was like county resources that were given and like, you know, I would say half the schools I worked with were super supportive, like gave mm -hmm. me an office, got to pull the kids out of some classes um, because again, they value, they, they realize they're not going to do well. They're not going to show up if we don't attend to their mental health um, right. get them connected with the resources. I think it's also empowering the parent, helping them to be an advocate for their kid and getting them the services that they um, that they need um, and and again I think it's working it's working with the schools and with the parents but I know this whole idea of it following them is also like part of the stigma yeah uh, the, the data does show though that the younger you get mental health interventions the longer term um, success you have over time and then you're not dealing with it later down the road um, and I think you know uh, like just remembering like that being a part of the advocacy and I think also if you come into the school whether you're on the outside or you're the parent also kind of coming in with the way of, of not coming like at the school, like okay. from the beginning and really just saying like, how can we work together? We all want the same things for this child. Um, and we have to figure out how we can work together. And sometimes with school refusal and things like that, you, you know, I've driven, I've driven to schools and walked into the, you know, into the building with the student um, or, you know, we, we come up with a plan, but I think thinking about getting the right professionals involved, um, utilizing the school psychology. And I know these, you know, there's systemic problems to all of this in different mm -hmm. districts and whatnot, but if you can be an advocate, get the help that they need, um, and then also kind of partner together as a team approach. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Kate, I don't want to speak for you, but I think, you know, like you said, like there were some signs that you were struggling at a younger age. And, and, and I don't think you would go back and say, oh, like that would have followed me. I think you probably been like, Oh, if I could have got like help for that even earlier, that could have helped me in the long run. So I think even, you know, again, once the stigma continues to break, I don't think people are going to feel like something's following them in the same way. Right. Yeah. What followed me was the trauma I was experiencing, you know, not the, I think that what you're sort of addressing, I think is both from a school perspective and also professionally, it's something I think that we've grown into as well is this idea that. Um, organizations that we spend a lot of our time in need to really focus on us as, as the whole person. Yeah. Um, and it starts with school and it's, it's happening now with corporations and uh, people need to really focus on, on the, the, the full health of the people that are entrusted to the organization in, in a couple different ways, but. 
and realizing that diagnoses can be a lifesaver for someone like Kate. She almost had to, you know, find a diagnosis for herself um, because she was struggling and was like Googling and trying to find that. But I think there's a lot of stigma even about getting a diagnosis that it's for life uh, where you can, you know, your, your anxiety and OCD depression, you know, that's not like a, a like a life sentence either. There are a lot of these um, disorders or these symptoms are effectively treated with evidence-based treatments. And so again, mm -hmm. getting the proper diagnosis for your child, I have had parents who are like, I, I don't want my kid to have a diagnosis because if they have a diagnosis, then again, like it's going to follow them instead of saying like, actually we need, we can, we need to get this treated and it, and it can be treated successfully with therapy and or medication. Mm -hmm. And so looking at it more as kind of a gateway into helping um, rather mm -hmm. than something that's a stigma. Yeah. Yeah, like I mean, you wouldn't be afraid of your kid being diagnosed with asthma or diabetes. You'd want to know so you could get them the effective treatments and thinking in those ways. Right. Um, it, I don't know if you guys have any opinions or if you're if you're aware of circumstances where it really works. That idea of, it, you know, I I remember when I was in elementary school, we would have to go for our hearing test. Right. We would get our eyes checked in school. Um, and if there was, if, if something was off, then our parents got a call and we went to the eye doctor. And um, I know that's how I wound up wearing glasses. <laughs> Otherwise, never would have known, right? Um, are you aware of mental health screening happening in school sort of along that similar line where, um, where, where kids are getting some sort of limited sort of gateway assessment early to sort of treating prevention, just like we do with all of the, you know, all of the other uh, physical health things that schools have embraced. It is happening. It's just, it's just wildly variable. Um, okay. and I think across different districts and, you know, who's going to pay and hopefully yeah. it will become something that's more uniform. I mean, I think all of us are going to start seeing it. You know, there's been a lot of integrated care models that have been practiced, even that like having a psychologist in your primary care office that does a quick check-in. Um, again, treating our physical and mental health with the same exact, like exactly the thing you're saying, like the hearing screening, and then yeah. you also do a mental health screening. Um, I know in colleges, they are starting to do these a lot more that they have like a depression screening day. Um, and, and almost all colleges have a counseling center now. I think we're going to start to see that um, developed at the, you know, at the middle school, high school level. And, um, you know, I think that's something that if you're on your board or, you, you know, school board, or if you have any, you know, impact um, with people that, you know, again, I think keep championing for the mental health and mental health services um, to be integrated uh, for, for your, um, for your child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, I certainly have opinions, but I'm not, um, <laughs> I'm not really qualified to share them here. But one thing I will say is that a lot, actually just today, right before this, I got a text from a friend who said, I have a friend who um, has a child with um, an anxiety, with who's starting to struggle with anxiety. Do you know someone? And so she, they're going, it's like a friend of a friend to me. And then I'll connect them to the doctors I know where she lives or the, or the resources I know where she lives. And even just the fact that right now it's so whispered down the lane and these resources right. are available widely. Um, there, isn't, there isn't a list of, of local treatment mm -hmm. providers. Even as simple as that, even you know, the, the gold standard would certainly be having you know, the appropriate professionals on site. But mm -hmm. Um, it just, it makes me so sad to see, you know, I, I'm always getting these questions that people don't even know where they can send their kid, right. um, as, as like, a as a, you know, probably somebody who can afford to get their kid treated in the suburbs around Philadelphia. And they're like, where do I start? Right. And they start with somebody like me who's out there going, Hey, I have this and, and I'm open about it. And so having these resources, I think is so important and starting it young is mm -hmm. even more critical. Um, mm -hmm. So just, I just add that as a, as a sort of. Um, and I'll even add on to that. Like, I think, you know, like Kate and I, we, we think that the, there need to be systemic changes, but you have our contact information here too. If also you need a friend of a friend, your kid, yep. Um, your niece, your nephew, someone that you've been working with, like your child, please reach out to us. And we do, you know, we, we, that's part of our mission to help people to get connected um, with the right uh, resources. So, uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it's, it's harder, you know, to, to find than maybe something else, but 
again, even if it's just us two, we're, we're here to help. And so feel free yeah. to reach out to us. We won't feel bothered. Not at all. Wonderful. It's an honor and a privilege Wonderful. to be able to help. Well, I want to be mindful of your time, and I don't, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, Thea and Kate, thank you, thank you so much. This was such a really, really good discussion and incredibly helpful overview, um, and we, we really appreciate, appreciate your time. As a reminder to everyone here, um, their podcast is Mind and View Podcast on Instagram. Um, we will be putting this uh, webinar up on our YouTube site. So if you want to go back and watch it again um, and take notes, I was taking tons of notes. If you want to share it with, with other folks, please feel free to do that. Um, a big thank you to our sponsor, NAMI Keystone PA. And uh, a reminder, our next uh, Parent Up webinar will be in November. The topic is on, uh, will be announced soon, but it's November 8th at the same time. But Kate and Thea, thank you so much. This has really been wonderful. We really appreciate your time. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Have a great evening.